Uh, on this note, our theme for the first talk is education in mother tongue. And I now request Ruchika to take this webinar forward with the rest of the speakers. Thank you, Professor Bolia, for introducing us to the theme of the day. To begin with the webinar, I would like to call upon Dr. Priyanka Kaushal to introduce Dr. Dheer Jhingran, our keynote speaker for today's special session. But before that, let me introduce you all to Dr. Priyanka Kaushal. Dr. Priyanka Kaushal is the National Co-Coordinator of the Unnat Bharat Abhyan and a faculty member at IIT Delhi. She holds a PhD in Chemical Process Technology. Prior to commencing work at Center for Rural Development and Technology, IIT Delhi, Professor Kaushal had worked with TUVN, Institute of Sustainable Energy, Environment and Economics, University of Calgary, UNIDO, UNEP, etc. She is working in the domain of clean energy technologies for last 15 years. I now request Dr. Kaushal to kindly welcome our keynote speaker. Thank you, Ruchika. Thank you very much. It's indeed my pleasure to introduce the next speaker today, Dr. Dheer Jingrun. Dr. Dheer Jingrun is the founder director of Language and Learning Foundation, LLF, an organization focused on improving literacy learning in public schools in India. He has worked in the primary education sector for over three decades within and outside the government. As an officer of the Indian Administrative Services, he was director in Ministry of HRD, now Ministry of Education, and principal secretary education, government of Assam. He has been advisor to UNICEF and Nepal's Ministry of Education. He has made a significant contribution to early grade reading programs and multilingual education in Asia, Africa, and India. Dr. Thiev has a PhD in education and has authored three books based on empirical research in education. Now I request Dr. Thiev Jinrin to kindly address the audience today. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, to Unnat Bharat Abhyan, all the members the organizers of this event, the Naya Bharati series in IIT Delhi, to give me this opportunity to talk about a subject that is really close to my heart and my professional work. And as uh, Professor Bolia said, is now center stage after the new education policy 2020, which is including children's languages in the teaching and learning process in classrooms. All of us are hugely concerned about the fact that uh, there is a learning crisis that is facing uh, our education system. Uh, we all know through various surveys that more than 50% of our kids in the age group of 6 to 10 or 11 cannot even read a simple text and understand it fully. Now, my belief based on a lot of research evidence across the world is this, that including languages of comprehension, including languages that children can understand, can be a big game changer in addressing this learning crisis. So I want to begin my, uh, my talk on that note, and I'll uh, share a presentation now. Uh, uh, someone will have to enable my sharing. Uh, yes, Dr. Jingren, uh, we're on it. Yeah, it'll happen soon. Right, so, uh, right. So basically, let's, uh, let's try and understand. Uh, I'll try and divide my talk into three parts. And what we'll do is that we'll try and have a uh, question and answer uh, in each section. In the first section, I would talk about how it's very important to have children's languages in the classroom and why language education is so important, uh, language as a medium of learning and children's languages are, are very crucial for that. In the second section, I will talk about what is uh, multilingual education. Uh, we are not here to say that children should learn only in their language and not uh, learn other languages as well. Uh, the national language, the state language, uh, English, they're all very important. And, and children should learn several languages well. So that's multilingual education. And uh, in the third, I will talk about what are the different strategies that can be used to ensure that children begin through a language they understand well and then acquire 
high proficiency in all the other languages and high academic achievement as well. So let me share my screen now. Uh, yes, sir, please. Yeah. Yeah, is that visible? Yes, sir. The PPT yeah. and the video is visible. Right. Okay. So, you mentioned that I'll talk about uh, in three sections, and let me begin my first section, uh, which is that it is very crucial to learn through a familiar language in primary school. And the points that I'm going to make here is this, that language is core to all learning in school which is, of course, uh, easy to understand. Uh, the way language is taught in primary schools today needs a thorough overhaul. The practices are inappropriate. And at the end, how children's home and familiar languages will help improve children's academic learning. I begin with this quote, uh, which is a favorite of mine, that language is almost everything to education, especially early education. And when language is taught in school, it's not a subject that is being taught. Children are being taught the foundation of learning itself, you know, how to learn. So language enables children to begin to learn. Any process that happens in school, whether it is talk, or reading, writing, thinking, group work, all of that uses language. And on the right hand side, you can see that language is absolutely crucial to all the higher order academic processes that happen uh, in school learning, you know, whether it's thinking, analysis, logical reasoning. So it's very important to build strong language and literacy skills beginning from the early grades. And these are not just basic communication skills, but what we call academic language skills. So it's very important because that is the medium for all learning. The new education policy uh, does lay a lot of importance to uh, basic language and literacy skills being acquired uh, in grades one to three in all schools by all children. However, it doesn't get linked to the issue of how do you work with children's languages first? It's in a different chapter, uh, the use of mother tongue uh, instruction. It's very important to link foundational literacy and numeracy which is a big target in the new education policy with the use of languages that children can comprehend. Sorry, I think uh, you could not hear the audio, but that's okay. Uh, I wanted to highlight how teaching and learning takes place in the classrooms today for language. Teacher talk dominates. So when we look at the percentage of time a teacher spends talking compared with children, uh, often in classrooms, it's 90 is to 10. Choral repetition, so repeating after the teacher, as was happening in this video, you couldn't uh, hear it. But there's choral repetition happening and copying work in the name of writing. Children are copying most of the time. Often children cannot even read 
and they 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 write and this is actually a quote at the bottom uh, from a research that i had done where a teacher pointed me to a child who she said has the best handwriting in the class and i discovered the child actually cannot even read so he was just copying the symbols so as you would see on the right hand side of the top teaching classrooms today is very demonstration and performance oriented a teacher is speaking a teacher is demonstrating something it's more like a performance and a textbook is used to teach language while as you can see on the right hand side language learning requires rich natural use of language you know a meaningful manner communication oriented style that is the way language is learned and a language uh, uh, develops our classroom teaching is today very far from the way uh, language teaching learning should happen and this becomes even more complex when children are trying to learn a new unfamiliar language coming to the third part of this uh, section 1 uh, as it is very crucial that children begin their early education through a home or a familiar language uh, in early childhood education as well as in the early school years this seems quite obvious but uh, let me just comments here the first of course is supports higher order comprehension the only way children can understand or comprehend especially order which involves thinking and reasoning will be through a language that they understand well and uh, i just want to uh, take two parts of this diagram if you can see here that Uh, at the bottom that reading comprehension which is of course the the most important skill that one learns skills and ability that one learns at school to be able to read a text and to be able to understand it at great depth uh, including inferential understanding also is the product of language comprehension so to be able to understand that language oral language comprehension and of course to be able to decode or to be able to decipher print to be able to what we commonly say read now if language comprehension is low as it happens when a child is studying through the medium of an unfamiliar language then reading comprehension will be very low even if the child learns to decode well so it's very important to develop strong oral comprehension of language in the initial years which can happen through a language the child understands well and then of course we have to build ability to understand other languages as well uh, to be able to build reading comprehension the second there's a lot of evidence around the world that using a, a home language as a medium of instruction improves learning and academic achievement in other subjects not just in language uh, but even science and math uh, in senior school so for example here several indian studies have shown uh, for example in in bodo and assamese medium that children who studied through a medium uh, which was their like the strong language their strong language uh, their performance was higher a very large study in ethiopia has shown that children who studied through their home language scored higher in science and math in secondary school and the results were that if they studied for 8 years in that language were higher compared with when they studied for 6 years in that language the home language or the familiar language compared with when they studied for only 4 years so that's very clearly uh, that achievement in other subjects is higher when you study through a medium that you understand Uh, in the us there have been large studies um, in the late 90s that show that uh, if you look towards the top of the graph uh, where it's 51 52 at the end 61 52 and these are models where two languages are used a language very familiar to the child and and a language that is unfamiliar and the child is learning a bilingual model you can see that learning achievements are much higher the learning achievements in the brown line Uh, at the bottom are the lowest where children are studying through a medium uh, of instruction which is a language that they do not understand so there's enough evidence a lot of evidence across the world to show that uh, that 
a, a medium of instruction that children uh, should be a language that children understand. There is also a lot of evidence, and we'll talk about it a little later, that if we start with a language that children know and are familiar with, their strong language, then that helps to learn other languages better, which is our objective. They should learn English well. They should learn the state language well. So that, that is very useful. Another important point is that using a language that children are familiar with helps create a positive self-image among children in class, a confidence. And there have been so many studies to show that if children are emotionally adjusted and they, uh, you know, in the classroom, they feel confident and they learn better. And that can happen if children's languages and cultures find place in the classroom. And of course, uh, this sounds obvious, but classrooms will become much more child-centered. Children will be very actively engaged if, the, if their language was used in the classroom. I have a video. I'm not sure, again, uh, this may not, uh, sound may not be there. But just please look at the way children are interacting with the teacher. The teacher is using a mix of children's language and Hindi. This is a classroom in Chhattisgarh where children uh, come from a different language background. Uh, the teacher is using a mix of language. The children are responding in whatever language they're comfortable with. Some children are responding in a mix of language, Chhattisgarhi, Hindi. Some are responding only in the local language. But the classroom is so vibrant uh, because their home language has been brought in there. So in this classroom, we find that the teachers engaging children in higher order questions, questions about why did this happen? What is your opinion about this? And all that was possible because a use of mixed language was being done. I'll stop here uh, for my first section. And uh, if there are any questions, uh, I'd like to uh, take them now. So Dr. Jingra, before we begin, uh, I just like to say that it was all audible. Actually, the videos are perfect. Oh. Um, quite, oh, nice. uh, quite good learning for me as well. Uh, the last video, particularly. Thank you. That's nice. Okay. Uh, hi, sir. We have a question from one of the participants. Right. Yeah. Good evening, sir. My question is. Is NEP 2020 advocating against the use of English as a medium of instruction? What is your recommendation about English medium schools from kindergarten or grade one? How will children learn good English if they do not start on it from very early on in the school? Shivam, I'd like you to hold on to your question for uh, the next, because I am actually addressing this uh, very, very directly in my section three. But, but just to say, uh, to answer your question here, um, I don't think the NEP says that children should not learn English. I think the indication definitely is this, that use a language that children understand you know, as a medium of instruction. It, it, it means that use English as a medium of instruction at a stage where children know enough of it to be able to learn through it. There's a difference between you know, just being able to understand a language and to be able to learn through a language. And I'll bring that out later. But uh, to your question, yes, I think there is an indication that early uh, use of English or an unfamiliar language as a medium of instruction is not the best for the child.
Should I get to my section two if there's? Yes, sir. Yeah. Ah, yes, Dr. Sure. Jingra, yeah, let's move on. I think there'll be more questions towards the end as well. Great, sure, sure, sure. So I said, I have just divided it uh, for convenience. Uh, the first one we established that it's important to use children's languages in the classroom. Uh, I'll now try to address some of the questions that, uh, the, you know, for example, the one asked, uh, <clears throat> what are the, some principles of learning language? What are some myths surrounding this? and end by saying that what we need to do is to introduce what's called multilingual education. Let's, let's learn several languages well, including English. That's very important. So I'll address some of these myths about learning languages, some principles of language learning. Why is it important to, that we have multilingual education? And what are the essential elements of that? Obviously, we are a multilingual society. We all know that uh, we we work through several languages in different domains, uh, you know, personal, at home, outside, at office, and education. So in a multilingual setting, obviously, we definitely need to learn several languages. We know that aspirations for English and other languages of economic power are high. We cannot neglect that. We also know that multilinguals are better. Uh, I don't have enough time to go into this evidence, but intellectually, cognitively, uh, multilinguals have been shown to be uh, superior to those who only operate in one language or monolinguals. Therefore, I'm arguing that it is mother tongue plus an important regional language plus English. That is what we should aim to do. And the education system can do this. Uh, therefore, build a strong uh, foundation of a language that children are familiar with, and then build on top of it language and literacy competencies in other languages. So we need multilingual education, not just mother tongue and not just English medium. It's very important to be uh, looking at how we can do MT++, mother tongue++. plus plus. But what is multilingual education? I think uh, there's so much confusion amongst educationists as well. Uh, you know, some people say it's for tribal children, uh, but what happens to English? Okay, let's do some little bit of uh, work with children's uh, home language in, in, you know, in grade one, just for a couple of months, and then that's enough. Uh, so various things are talked about in the name of multilingual education. Uh, we'll see what, uh, what it could be. I argue, as many other people, uh, who are uh, education, uh, who are working with primary education, that multilingual education is for all. It's for all children, not just for tribal children who speak a very different language at home, but it's also for children who are today studying through English medium. And at school, they're not allowed to use other languages. So I'm arguing that multilingual education is the way a multilingual society like India must work it through its education system. So it's not, it's not something which is confined to some people and some children. Let me come to some common misconceptions about language use in education. And uh, it'll address uh, something that Shivam asked as well. Uh, the first is a thought that the more time you spend on a particular language, the better it is for learning that language. Or the earlier you start the language, for example, start English in lower KG, in preschool, that earlier start to an unfamiliar language, children will learn better. That's not true, as we will see here. Uh, also, this thought that you know, children, are, uh, children can pick up languages easily. And therefore, let's do one thing. Let's immerse them in an unfamiliar language from the very beginning. Let them learn through English or an unfamiliar language, and they'll learn to swim. You know, like, like if you throw a child into water, but actually what happens is that's, that's in education, it's called a submersion approach that, that actually leads to failure and dropout. So that's the other myth. The fourth one here, uh, which I will address again later, is that... If you spend more time on one language, for example, if you spend time working with children in Hindi, then the space in the mind, in the brain of the child gets occupied by Hindi, and therefore 
once you start filling the balloon of English, there's much less space available to fill an English balloon. Now, that is wrong. That's, that's incorrect. So I, we'll talk about it. Uh, the, the last one is that an understanding that if a child learns to speak a language, for example, children pick up English, let's say, uh, in a couple of years at school, and then they're ready, therefore, to be learning through it as a medium of instruction. That's not true. Because, as I said earlier, language in a communicative, conversational manner is very different from learning through a language, which requires learning academic skills, which is thinking or reasoning or analysis, thinking through that language. That doesn't happen. So therefore, a lot of uh, I, I hear so much talk to say, well, why can't, uh, you know, and everyone gives the example of their own kids, you know, in our settings, they, they learned English so well and they didn't have to learn through any other uh, language. That case is different because they get a lot of support at home. But for the child who does not get an environment for English, even if she picks up in a couple of years conversational English, she's not ready to be uh, taught through that language, which requires a very different set of uh, abilities. So to that question, which I had earlier, do languages occupy separate spaces in the brain, like different balloons? No. This is uh, proven through research and, and as well as theorizing. And uh, without going into this too much, but the belief that languages develop totally separately you know, on the left-hand side, you can see as if two separate balloons of languages are being developed and grown is incorrect. And languages have a strong common underlying proficiency. And therefore, developing one language also helps other languages. And that underlying proficiency grows as languages grow. And therefore, it is very important to realize that several languages can grow at the same time, not at the cost of one another. And just uh, highlighting the same, uh, this is called the dual iceberg uh, model. I, I'm tempted to put a little bit of theory here because you're an academic audience. Uh, that's why. So basically saying that if a strong underlying proficiency of one language is developed first, it will really help in transferring some of these skills and abilities and concepts to another language that the child starts to uh, pick up later. And the child will do equally well in that language uh, because at, at one level, there is an underlying proficiency uh, of different languages. Uh, and the last point that I want to make here is this, that uh, it's not enough to say, let's do a bit of uh, use of L1. When I say L1, this is the strong or the familiar or the home language of the child, L1. That's the common uh, usage that we use. So this needs to be continued for some time because as I was distinguishing between conversational proficiency and academic learning proficiency, so the latter takes time to develop. That's why it's important to use a familiar language for longer duration. An unfamiliar language should be first taught as a subject, help children develop basic proficiency and some academic skills, and then use it as a medium of instruction. That's the, that's the principle there. Uh, and even when we have shifted to a different language as a medium of instruction, it's important to use the scaffolding, the support, of children's strong languages as far as needed, you know, primary school, middle school, for different concepts, for science where there are, uh, you know, concepts are difficult to explain and understand. Let's not hesitate to use children's languages at that time, even though the medium of instruction has shifted to English or another language. And if possible, keep adding languages without subtracting the home language. And in, in, in education terms, in multilingual education, we say that's a subtractive model where we remove a language and say, now that we are done with it, children can learn through other languages. It's important to keep that language alive in the classroom as a scaffold to help children continue to learn for higher order comprehension as and when needed. 
So that's very important. And so as we discussed already, that children pick up languages, uh, but they can't be used for teaching straight away till they've developed some strong academic competence there. So to end this section, uh, uh, when I say multilingual education, I am basically saying that there is a need to develop a strong multilingual awareness in the teachers and system. Uh, you can see here about language hierarchies. Uh, languages have different status, even though we are multilingual and we keep, uh, you know, we feel very happy about it. India is a multilingual society, but languages have different statuses, you know, with English at the top and a tribal language, let's say, at the bottom. So it is important that in the system, education system, there is a feeling that these languages are inferior, children's home languages, and they are substandard and they cannot be used in the education system. So it's important to address this first, that language is something which is uh, a means of expression and learning. Every language is adequate. It hasn't been developed fully because we have not it. So it's important to develop an awareness that there are dominant languages, there are non-dominant languages, and all of them should find place, whatever is best for the child. And then, as I said, number two is to focus on uh, developing bilingual multilingual competence, not just in their mother tongues, but also in uh, other languages, including English. And when we include children's home languages, sorry, uh, we should include them formally so that teachers are aware they actually use it in a strategic manner, not just by translating, but in a strategic manner. Along with language, use children's culture and prior experiences in the classroom in the early grades, you know, classes one, two, three. It's very important for children's, as I said, self image and self efficacy. Uh, that was my section two uh, about why multilingual education is important for India. Uh, I need guidance of whether I go on to section three or should we take a few questions here? So we uh, we do have few questions. Okay, so I will. Hello, sir. My name is Himanshi, and my question to you is that India has more than sixteen hundred mother tongues. So, is it possible to deliver early education in so many different languages or mother tongues? For instance. Can tribal language be used for teaching in school? Right. Imanshi, uh, all of you are really bright and you go far ahead of uh, where I am. Uh, and this is the topic of my next section. Uh, but but let, me say, sorry, let me say that any language can be used for, as a medium of instruction. Yes, that language, if it has never been used uh, and, and has not been written, it needs to be done a little bit. But any language is capable of being used for teaching. And uh, to address your question very quickly, uh, in Orissa, for example, there is a multilingual education program for the last uh, 20 years almost, uh, 15 years, sorry, uh, which is using 16 languages in different schools, uh, tribal languages, as mediums of instruction. Yes, it is. It is complex, it is an intensive process, but it is possible. I am not advocating right now that we should pick up 1600 mother tongues and use them as a medium of instruction. Uh, that is my next section actually here. But, but we must convince that it is possible to learn through any language. And I think as uh, Professor Bolia was saying, uh, uh, in the PISA, the international assessment that happens, uh, the countries that do the best, Japan, South Korea, Estonia, Ireland, Finland, all of them, children actually take that PISA assessment, that test in their own languages, not in English. So it is definitely possible. Uh, but yes, we have to decide what, what, what is uh, best and appropriate. Uh, Namaskar, sir. I am Shubham. And my question is, like Andhra Pradesh has decided to make English as the medium of instruction from grade one. So will it not help children to learn good English and get better jobs? 
Okay. Uh, sorry again to say this is a definitely a question I'm addressing, and I I definitely say that children should learn very good English, very very important. But probably the best way to do that is not to start in grade one. Uh, starting in grade one could actually result in children not learning very good English because they don't have a foundation. They don't that language is not around them. Uh, that language is not the language of comprehension for them. So while I'm with you that it's very important to learn English for employment, for empowerment, but the best way is not to start in grade one or even earlier, as people say, in, in lower KG and upper KG. Uh, there are strategies of doing this, which I will address uh, very soon in the next section. So I, I request Dr. Jingren, let's move I'll to the next on. section. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll take uh, 10 minutes for the next section, and then we can have a few more questions after that. Right. And here I, I'm going to talk about practical approaches and strategies for a country like India to include children's languages. We we saw in the last section that we have to include children's languages, but also ensure that children learn other languages well. And I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about the language context in the country, which are very varied. Uh, what are the appropriate approaches and strategies in different contexts that can be used? So very practically, uh, how can we uh, bring in children's languages? Uh, the whole conundrum about English medium and some policy imperatives. Uh, now, the census, of course, uh, puts languages at about 120. Uh, the People's Linguistic Survey of India, I'm sorry, it's PLSI, um, counts 780 plus. Mother tongues over three, uh, 2,000. Uh, only 31 used as uh, mediums of instruction. Uh, just to say why the census lists only 122 languages. If you can see here, languages like Bhojpuri, Rajasthani, Chhattisgadi, Magadi, all with more than 10 million speakers are all clubbed under Hindi. While actually, uh, the intelligibility between Hindi and some of these languages may be quite low. So uh, India has a large number of languages. Uh, it's very difficult to put a number to it, but definitely higher than what the census has did. And uh, this is just from uh, three uh, parts of the country where my organization, the Language and Learning Foundation, works. Just to say how, how complex and varied it is, in some places you cannot even give a label to a language because that language has borrowed from several languages. It's not a pure language label that we can give. Even in, you see the middle one, which is Dungarpur in Rajasthan, we work with Bagri speaking children, Adivasi uh, community. Uh, they are learning through Hindi medium, but even Vagdi has got several variants or dialects. So they are quite different from each other and influenced by Gujarati, Hindi, Mewadi, several other languages. Uh, I'm just trying to say that language situations are quite complex and without understanding language situations, it is difficult to say what we should do. For example, in Chindwada and Madhya Pradesh today, Gondi speaking Adivasis have almost given up speaking in Gondi in some areas. And they picked up and they speak the local uh, variant of, uh, of Hindi that is influenced by Marathi. Uh, it's not even uh, the standard Hindi that we know. So it's important to know what children speak when they come to school to be able to then decide what strategies work best. And uh, that brings me to the second part of my section three, which is the approaches to multilingual education need to be different and designed based on what is the local situation. And I'll not go into details about what it could be, but this is about what languages children speak, uh, what is a language used as a minimum instruction. So a lot of things can, will decide what is the best approach to uh, introducing children's languages. And I highlight here three possible approaches, and I'll run through that very quickly. The first one is, what is more common concept of uh, mother tongue based education, which basically means you start with the mother tongue of the child as the medium of instruction, whether it's a tribal language or it is uh, Hindi or in, even Chhattisgadi or Bagri, and continue that for a few years. 
if you continue only for about two or three years, that's called early exit bilingual program because you're exiting that language and then you're shifting totally to another language as the medium of instruction. A late exit would mean you continue with that language as the medium of instruction for you know five, six grades, which is what the NEP is arguing for, you know, at least until five, if possible, grade eight. While during this period you build the competence of the child in the second language or the the language, uh, say Hindi or English, uh, which then the child is ready in five years' time to then study through that language. And even after that, L1, the child's home language, can continue as a subject. So that's mother tongue based multilingual education, which begins with the mother tongue as the medium of instruction for several years. That's the first model. And this is what is happening in Orissa today in about 1,600 schools in 16 languages. The second model, which is, as I said, easier to implement, can be done at much larger scale, is where in Bihar or, or in, say, Jharkhand or in Rajasthan, Hindi would continue to be the medium of instruction, even from grade one. But the children's language, say, Vagdi or Magadi or Chhattisgadi, is used throughout primary school in a strategic manner. Not this, you know, teacher wants to use it, can use it in some ways, but in a strategic manner, at least in the oral, to support learning and for higher order comprehension while the child continues to learn the second language uh, gradually, but the scaffold of the first language of the child is always present. This is something that uh, we have tried out in a large number of schools, and, and it really helps children to learn. Again, the first model is, of course, the best, where you can uh, have mother tongue as a medium of instruction for as long as possible, five years, eight years. But where you cannot, then, at least ensure that that language is available in the classroom in a very structured manner in the oral domain. The third one, and this is more complex. In India, typically, apart from urban areas like Delhi, even in uh, many uh, rural areas, you find that there are children with several languages in one classroom. There are, suppose, a Gondi speaking area, you've got some Gondi speaking children, some uh, Chhattisgadi uh, or Halbi speaking children in the same classroom. Because of the mixed economy, you have children of different language backgrounds. And there, it is complex because neither mother tongue based instruction will work. Which mother tongue? Sometimes there is a linked language, which is the language of communication in that area. You know, in that area, uh, people communicate with each other in, in a particular language. That may not be very familiar to young children because they don't go out of the house as much, five year olds, but at least they have some exposure to that language. But elsewhere, we have to work with multiple languages for children in the classroom and help them learn uh, you know, Hindi or English well. So broadly, three approaches to be followed based on a clear understanding of what is the situation in the classroom. And topic that's uh, really of interest to a large number of people is English. NEP against English, why not English? Is mother tongue against English? So it's very important to understand. At the beginning also, I said, it's mother tongue plus plus. And English is very important as well. Now, a large number of schools in primary uh, use, private schools use English as the medium of instruction uh, from pre-primary uh, stage. And as uh, Shubham, I think, said that in Andhra Pradesh now, they've begun to use English uh, in the government system. Many other states are starting some model schools for English, you know, like, like a caste system. You know, these are schools that are English. The, these are the aspirational schools. There'll be a merit test to get into that school, etc. The arguments that are used to say why English should be there are all wrong from a child's perspective. The government system and the government teachers are arguing for English medium or English to be brought in English medium because they're losing out enrollments to private schools. And, and that is the biggest argument that is pointed out that we are 
you know, we might have to shut down a large number of schools if we do not introduce English medium. That's one argument. And the other argument, uh, which we have tackled already, is that to learn English well, it's best to start early, you know, preschool, because that's the best way to learn English well and use it as a medium of instruction. But we have tackled this question and saying that starting early is not good, is not the best way. It's important to build a foundation and then when the child understands language, understands languages, then a lot of further building of unfamiliar languages can be done. These languages will be learned much better if we start a little later with a strong foundation of a more familiar language. The third argument, which is even more complicated for us to address, is that, you know, in urban areas and everywhere, all your middle class and, uh, you know, so-called intelligentsia, intelligence their children are going to English medium schools. Why are we depriving children, you know, in, in remote rural areas and Adivasis from studying in English medium public schools? <clears throat> now, I think my response to this is, yes, they have a right to learn and uh, develop very good English, but the route to that probably is not to start learning through English in lower KG and upper KG. So, and very controversially, uh, and, I, and I, I, I raise this everywhere, an ideal approach to teaching of, to English in our schools is not to allow English as a medium of instruction until grade three, I would argue grade five, in all schools, because you cannot have a different rule for public schools, government schools, and private schools, because uh, you know private schools sort of lead the way in terms of uh, you know what, what, what others uh, the government system looks towards. Uh, informal and oral introduction of English can begin earlier, you know, even at pre-primary or grade one. That's fine. Let's make it a national mission to improve the teaching of English through a multilingual approach. Let's not say, like you saw in that poster, that keep your languages outside. This is going to be an English-only classroom. No. But, but improve the teaching of English, which is very poor right now because of teacher capacity, et cetera. Make it a mission that children learn good English. That's very important from, uh, you know, fr uh, from grade one, speaking, at least initially. And then our target will be that children develop strong conversational skills initially, uh, oral comprehension, and then very good literacy skills uh, by grade six to eight. That is what I would argue for, uh, for English as a country, uh, for us, for all our uh, kids to become very strong multilinguals. So finally, that I end this with this slide. It's not about a mother tongue versus a dominant language, say Kannada or Tamil versus English. It's about using a familiar language and then moving towards a multilingual proficiency for all children in two or three languages, including English. So that's, that's uh, thank you so much for listening patiently. And if you have questions, I'm ready to. Yes, sir. We do have a few more questions. Yes, please. Good evening, sir. My name is Astha, and my question is, social activists and organizations argue for the children to get in way of emancipation and catching up with the other communities. So, <clears throat> sir, what response on this? Yes, I was trying to address this question to say it is very important. English is not for the elite. English should be for everyone. But what is the best way for children to learn good English? A lot of research all over the world has said, has shown that the best way to learn an unfamiliar language very well is to base that on a foundation of a language that the child, which is the child's strong language. And then slowly build that proficiency and only then shift to it as English medium. So what I'm arguing is let's improve our education system, improve the teaching of English, which is very poor in government schools right now, 
but not make english as a medium immediately because the child needs to learn enough of a language to be able to learn through that language that distinction i'm trying to make you have to learn a language well to be able to learn through that language so it is very important to start english early as a subject good conversational speaking communicative skills do that for several years once that competence is there then sh- if necessary i mean i would say only if if it's uh, if necessary you can shift to a medium of english so i'm all in favor of everyone learning good english i'm just saying the roots to that is not via starting english in lower kg a lot of private schools a study that i have done myself children actually do not learn good english what happens in these private schools as well as government schools which are english mediums a for apple b for ball because teachers themselves do not know communicative english they do not they, uh, i'm not talking of the elite school so my argument is let's get children to be to have very good conversational skills first and then build on that for english medium and all children yes definitely including disadvantaged children hello sir i am mahendra vidya for you is how can our country prepare to get good results in international assessment like pisa right this is what everyone thinks about and very important also uh what is pisa about pisa is about reading comprehension right yeah if you had a look at the test it is about reading comprehension mainly in 15 year olds those who are you know in the age group of 15 years now what is reading comprehension as i showed on a slide reading comprehension is language comprehension multiplied by strong fluent decoding skills decoding is the ability to decipher print read letters quickly read words quickly so it's very important that we build strong oral language comprehension in the language in which our children have to take the pisa test it can be whichever language it need not be english uh, pisa does not say that uh, the test has to be taken in english whichever language uh, uh, the children uh, want to want to take that in so it's very important to build reading comprehension from the beginning and reading comprehension as i said you require to build strong oral language comprehension skills and how do you build oral language comprehension skills of the higher order uh, pisa is all about thinking and reasoning you you are given a paragraph then you have to think and reason and answer multiple choice questions uh, based on inference and analysis to build those skills you have to build strong oral higher order comprehension this can be done best in a language that children understand well it can be english yes but after children have picked up enough english proficiency then we can do uh, we can do pisa in english as well but but the best thing is to build a lot of oral comprehension skills in a language that is familiar and and the strong language of children so dr jingra a couple of questions from my side actually before we conclude um so one question is <laughs> so this this comes from um, you know my experience of interacting very closely with my absolutely wonderful students you know they haven't raised it directly with me ever but sometimes i wonder if this is a question that's going in their head right which is you know let's look at the word jolly right now uh, people who start speaking english late in the life and if they are from you know let's say my own place right rajasthan they would call it jolly right because hindi has a jo right and not a jaw right? right so will people forever be stuck with jolly and never be able to move to jolly if they don't learn it from from the beginning you know will the accent play a role because you know, that's a social pressure right it's a social stigma to not be able to jolly and <laughs> be jolly instead yes you're right accent is best picked up in the early years uh, you know young children are best placed to pick up uh, the native accent Uh, it's true and and jolly can probably never become jolly 
uh, unless it's used very often in the conscious effort for many of the things. So it is it is a problem. The question I'm saying, I'm saying that, so I'm saying that we must introduce conversational English or whichever language we want early. Uh, where, where, where that's called the sensitive window when children pick up language as well. You know, that's, you know, ages three to eight. Uh, but but that's not for teaching of languages. That sensitive window is for picking up what you're saying. Through natural exposure to language, you pick up a language. But for learning a language well, actually, I, I, I did not mention that argument. Three to eight is not the best age group to teach a language and to be able to learn a language through teaching and learning process taught, older children learn much better. Adolescents learn it much better because their mind is then uh, thinking about language. It's called metalinguistic awareness, but that is built when children are older. But as you said, accents, are native accents are best picked up by young children. So yes, uh, that's, that's useful. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether... Uh, later in life, uh, uh, how important it is to just have a strong accent or also have very strong comprehension skills. Uh, but but yes. No, as an educationist, I completely agree with you. I'm, I'm just trying to you know put myself oh. in their shoes and imagine. Sure, sure. Uh, and sure. the last question from my side, Dr. Jingra, before we uh, you know move on to our next speaker, who's been very patiently waiting. Uh, uh, so, you know, the ideas that you mentioned are brilliant. I'm actually fascinated by, you know, many things that you said, and I'll summarize that as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, these are, I mean, uh, you know, the education process, it takes a good 10 years before you realize what the product is, right? I mean, you don't come to know immediately. So, and therefore, I think it becomes difficult for uh, for schools who, who uh, appreciate this idea, the approach that you mentioned, whether model one or model two, um, of, uh, you know, introducing English in a certain way. And by that time, most of the parents, and pardon me for using this term, most of the parents and the society are already sold to a particular model. How do we deal with that situation? You know, how do you, uh, you know, prevent this enticement towards something that might actually be harmful in the long run? Right, right. So first is to recognize that it is harmful. Harmful for the child and harmful Care for comprehension, care for real learning. You know, if we care for just uh, being able to uh, decode and, and and speak a few sentences, but if we really care for learning, then it is harmful to be starting through a language that is unknown to the child, unfamiliar. Now, it is important first for the education system, and then for media and others to be convinced about this that children must learn good English, and I keep repeating that. Can the education system, you know, tell the parents that children by grade three are going to be speaking and understanding and, 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 and learning good English as far as oral communication skills are concerned? Because most parents actually care for that. But I think we have not been able to communicate that. And I agree that it's a, it's a communication challenge to say, What's very important is children learn to speak English and understand English. And that can happen through good teaching of English without necessarily being uh, using English as a medium. So uh, there are ways of doing it. It's, it's happened in some programs and projects. But I think it, it is a big communication challenge. And, and it is a challenge which, as a country, we have to take up. Because if we care to do well in PISA, then we have to ensure that there is good comprehension which can happen on a strong foundation of a familiar language. So, yeah. No, wonderful. I think that makes complete sense, Dr. Jingra. And uh, I think we would actually, you know, keep engaging with you, subject to your time permitting, of course, uh, to see how to take these ideas forward, including that of the communication bit that you just mentioned. I think it's important to sort of do something around that. Right. Uh, but I mean, uh, I think, we need to move to the next speaker, but I would really, really, really want to thank you. We did not really give you enough notice and you agreed very kindly to sort of come here, spend all this time uh, and also all through the logistics. I think you were very kind to sort of give us time. Thank you so very much for all of that. Uh, Dr. Jingra, I personally learned at least one thing apart from other things which I can directly use, which is in my classes at IIT. I, I, I of course, translate here and there where I feel that there is a need and students may not get it. 
But I think this idea that you introduce of strategically using this, right? So, I mean, that got me thinking and maybe I will think about what are some of those strategic points and ideas right. and overall framework, right. which, I, right. which I should be using in my own teaching. So thanks a lot in a very personal way. But to sort of also summarize what I got from your session, because we'll make notes and, you know, uh, you know, take it to people, Dr. Jingran, is I think one point that you mentioned, which is amazing, is, uh, you know, kids are also learning how to learn. You know, I mean, we take it for granted as adults. I think that how to learn part is subtle. And at least the more educated ones among us should really try to understand that how to learn is a major question. You know, I mean, it's not it's not trivial. And that really is not possible unless you go by the model of mother tongue initially, at least. Uh, I'm fascinated by the kind of evidence that you showed, right? I mean, the usual evidence is that you you do well and Germany, France, Israel are doing well. But I think there is uh, there is evidence in the form of the actual process itself as to what happens when you follow a certain process. And that was very, very good learning for all of us. Uh, this whole idea of having a positive self-image, I think uh, nobody can agree with me, uh, you know, more than uh, me on that. Uh, I think, uh, you know, in my own childhood, I've had situations where, uh, you know, self-image for me has been an issue. And I think unless you really, you know, end this dichotomy between the formal world of a classroom and the and my own real world, which is out of the classroom, right, unless we can sort of align that more, I think it'll be very difficult for us to get kids who are who are good and who are not just achievers but also good citizens overall, right? And I think I think that's absolutely brilliant. Um, I think the other point that I really you know um, would like to mention over and above what you mentioned here, Dr. Jingan, is um, I think there is a confusion sometimes, conflation of ideas, right? So government schools not getting kids is not only because of English. On lack of English. I mean, there are a whole lot of other things also sure. that are at play here. And I think we need to be working on that. The new education policy is a great step as far as the philosophy is concerned. And I think it can be done. If the American public schools can be the most sought after, and if India can have the best public universities, right? I mean, when you come to higher education, people usually think of government colleges as the best ones. I mean, why can't we do it, uh, you know, in our own way uh, in school education also? I'm sure uh, we'll be able to do that. And we really look forward to engaging with you further, Dr. Jigran, on that. Thank you so very much once again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.